we go. Let's finish our series called Through the Waters. Through the Waters. And if you've missed any of the, 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 the sermons in this series, I encourage you to jump online or jump on our Mosaic Church app and you can check them all out there. But we've talked about all these different times in Scripture that had to do with water. From creation when God divided the waters and when, when, when they crossed the Red Sea, the Israelites, and when uh, they crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land. And then last week we talked about Elijah and Elisha crossing the Jordan River as well on dry land. But this week, you know, we've talked about crossing the crossing on dry ground. This week, we're not going through the water. We're going to walk on top of the water. And we're going to talk about Peter and, and just what happened to him when Jesus called him out on to the water. And so a little bit of the context of this story, if, if you want to turn to Matthew 14 and you can look right before this instance, we see that Jesus had just fed the 5,000 with a couple fish, some loaves of bread. What an amazing miracle. And so can you imagine after this amazing miracle of abundance and provision and, and multiplication and, and all these people going home full of faith that, man, they're, they're around something special, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God in the flesh. And so they have this amazing experience. But then something happens when the crowds are away in the middle of the night. How many of you have ever had something crazy happen in the middle of the night, right? I've woken up in the middle of the night and had to take one, my kids to the emergency room. You've, you know, things that happen in the middle of the night usually aren't good. Can I get an amen? You wake up in the middle of the night to the sound of water and you go down and your, your basement's flooded. You wake up in the middle of the night to just a, a horrible phone call. And, and so a lot of times things that happen in the middle of the night if they're notable, they're not very good. And so this happens when the crowds are away. It happens in the middle of the night. But one just takeaway that I think is an overarching thought for this whole message is that significant growth in your personal faith, significant growth in your personal faith usually happens more in obscurity than in public. You see, the disciples go from being the rock stars. They're the ones that get to hand out the food. How cool is that? It's like they're handing out the bowl that never goes empty. They're handing out the, the, the basket of food that never goes dry. They're, they're getting to be like, whoa, they're with Jesus. And then this crazy thing happens in the middle of the night. When nobody's around. Nobody's watching. It's just them and Jesus. You see, a lot of times we focus on the things that happen in public. We focus on the things that, that people get to see. We focus on the, the ministry and the platform. We focus on the, the ministry of, of leadership and getting to do what, you know, what, what people get to see. And, and, and sometimes, though, we, we kind of get it backwards and, and we forget that, man, God does really deep works in our hearts and in our lives when nobody's around. You see, when we leave God at church, when we leave God on the mountaintop and we only interact with him there, then these encounters don't happen much in our life. And so think about that. But the first thing that we see in this story, if you want to open a Matthew 14 or open the Mosaic Church app and you can follow along in the notes, there's also some half copy or half sheet copies on, on your seats. But the first thing we see in Matthew 14, 22 is that prayer fueled the journey. Prayer fuels the journey. It says that immediately after this, immediately after what? Jesus feeding the 5,000. Wow, right? Immediately after this, Jesus insisted. Now, in some other translations, it says he compelled. One even says he constrained. And so get the verbiage here. He insisted, he compelled, he constrained that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Now, over and over throughout the Gospels, Jesus models this, that, that, that after intense ministry, it's time for intense time of prayer. After intense time of, of giving, 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 it's time to get refilled. It's time to get with the Father. It's time to, to be dependent on the one that gives all the power. And so Jesus, probably to the disciples, 
you know, lack of understanding, he forces them to get on the boat and to go to the other side of the lake. I can only imagine what was going through their heads. They're like, Jesus, well, how are you going to get to the other side of the lake? What are we going to do on the other side without you? I thought we're supposed to follow you, and now you're telling us to go away from you. But Jesus knew how much he needed time with the Father. Jesus knew how much he just needed to get away. Now, I'll be honest. After three nights with your kids, I felt a little need to get away. Come on, somebody. I felt the need to, to just sit on my couch and close my eyes and listen to the silence. And boy, was it glorious. It was amazing. Right? And so I, I can relate with Jesus. He, he's been with these 5,000 people all hungry. You know what people get like when they're hungry? They get hangry. And they're probably, oh, it's too far to buy food. And oh, you know, I don't like fish. Oh, I don't like. And it's like, oh, just just quiet with all of it. I need some time. So Jesus knew how much he needed time with the father. Other people didn't get it. His disciples didn't get it. And so Jesus had to be incredibly intentional. He had to insist. He had to compel. He had to constrain them to get on the boat and go to the other side of the lake. But here's, here's what we see through this whole story is that when God seems distant, Jesus goes on the mountain, they go in the water. They're not close to him. When God seems distant, he knows where you're at and he doesn't just know where you're at. Jesus knew exactly where the disciples were. He knew exactly where they were going, but he's praying for you. This is a picture of what Jesus is doing right now for you. That Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father when he left this earth. It says that he's sitting at the right hand of God in heaven. And what is he doing? He's interceding for you and for me. Man, that's kind of like the picture we see here. Jesus climbs the mountain. He ascends. And what does he do? He prays. He talks to the Father. He spends that much needed alone time. And I bet you that on his heart were prayers for his disciples that they would understand, that they would see, because guess what? After Jesus fed the 5,000, they didn't get it. They still didn't get who Jesus was, how powerful he was, how good he was. And so I bet that he was up on that mountainside and he was praying for them. And if Jesus needs that kind of time in prayer, if Jesus needs to get alone with God and sometimes pray all night, then you and I probably should too. Prayer and solitude should be priorities in our life. There should be times in our life where we tell everyone else to just get on home because we're going to spend some time with Jesus. There should be times in our life when we forcefully put ourselves in solitude. Right? People don't always understand when you stick to your priorities. People don't always understand when you've got a schedule to keep and they're not on it. But Jesus... Stuck to his priority list, stuck to his schedule, and spent his time with God. So he's up all night. He's up early. A lot of times he's sacrificing. You know, one, one thing that um, Mark Batterson says that I just love, he says, a change of place plus a change of pace equals a change of perspective. A change of place plus a change of pace equals a change of perspective. And I could see Jesus needing this just to get away and to, to just reset. And that, that is so like it is for me that sometimes I just need to change my pace. I need to get somewhere different and I need to get a new perspective. How many of you know you're too busy not to pray? You're too busy not to get alone with God and get power from Him. And so the second thing that we see and we see this in the life of the disciples is that fear destroyed their focus. Remember, they had just had this amazing time of ministry. Jesus sends them off across the lake. And so it says, meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came walking, came toward them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. 
Now, I can't tell you why they didn't recognize him. Maybe it was the fog. Maybe it was the waves. Maybe it was the water splashing in their face. Maybe they, they had that glaze over their eyes from just being wet. Who knows? But here's what we do know. That Jesus, who had just done a massive miracle, had sent them. He knew exactly where they were at. They might have thought, why in the world would Jesus, who does all these amazing things, sent us out here? Have you ever thought that? God, why did you send me here? Why did you send me into this storm? Why did you send me someplace? If you know it all, and if you're, you really are who you say you are, why am I here? I could imagine the disciples had those kind of thoughts. But I think they just had short-term memory loss because of their fear. Now listen, they were fishermen. They had probably experienced some high seas. They had probably experienced some storms on the water before. Who knows, maybe they even knew that it was gonna be a bad night. Back then, the best weathermen were fishermen. Maybe they even knew, maybe that's why Jesus had to insist. Maybe that's why Jesus had to compel. Maybe that's why Jesus had to constrain them to go out on the water. Because they're like, Jesus, this is not a good night to go out on the water. But they still went, even at Jesus' command. And so it doesn't really matter what they were thinking. All we know is that they were terrified when they saw Jesus. They didn't expect to see Jesus when they saw him. Their circumstances clouded their judgment. And I don't know about you, but I can get there really, really easy. The wrong um, turn happens in a relationship and all of a sudden I'm questioning everything. The wrong turn happens in circumstances. Maybe a car breaks down or, or something goes out at the house and all of a sudden I'm asking myself, God, why have you done this to me? And it's just a broken car, right? Or just life happens and all of a sudden, all of the sense that I had to follow and trust in God and keep my feet on the rock goes out the window. But in the midst of immense blessings, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus being with them and doing miracles, the storms hit and the disciples just completely lost it. I think that the lesson here for us is that if we know fear destroys our focus, that we remember it's going to happen, that we're gonna face storms, we're gonna face hard times, we're gonna go through things that make us question. Me and, me and my boys were watching a documentary this last week and it was about this guy, this Nepalese, um, amazing uh, physically fit guy that decided he was gonna hike or he was gonna climb the 14 8,000 meter peaks in seven months. So this is over 26,000 feet tall mountains. And he's like, I'm gonna climb all 14 of them in seven months. The fastest it had ever been done before this was seven years. And before that, the first guy that ever did it, it took him like 16 years to accomplish the feet. And so this guy, it's like, I'm gonna do it in seven months. And so at one point in his journey over these seven months, he's coming down off the mountain. And because he had been trying to save this dude, because he'd been kind of selfless, he had, he had run out of his oxygen because he was giving it to somebody else. And all of a sudden, he gets this thing that they called HACE, H-A-C-E. And it's high altitude cerebral edema. Now, the only reason that he was able to navigate that and help not only himself down the mountain, but another guy that he found going down the mountain that had the same thing was because he knew what he was experiencing. He understood what the lack of oxygen would do to his life. He understood that in those conditions, when storms hit, when stuff happened, when he was without oxygen for such a period of time that he would get disoriented, that he would start to hallucinate and see things. He knew what was happening as it happened. And he talked about that was the only thing, you know, just he knew it was happening, so he just had to focus all of his energy and just bring every ounce of energy into getting down the mountain that he had, and he made it. Only because he knew it would happen was he able to navigate out of it. And I think that's the lesson that we learn from the disciples here, is they see Jesus and they just totally lose it. They think it's a ghost, and, and, but hey, Jesus sent them. He knew where they were at, right? And maybe, maybe, just maybe, when we're going through storms, when we're going through things, we shouldn't be so surprised. 
when Jesus shows up. And maybe if we know that the fear is going to come and we know the storm is going to come, then we can keep our focus when it does come. The third thing that we see in this story is that Jesus' presence brings opportunity. It says, then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking in the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. Right? So Jesus says, don't be afraid. Take courage. I'm here. Jesus. And Peter's like, oh my goodness. If it's really you. And I love the verbiage there because it's almost as if Peter doesn't really know if it is him or not. It's almost like Peter, there might, maybe it's just a little doubt there. God, if it's really you, tell me to come. Some of us, we want to be sure. We want to know that we know that we know that we know. But for Peter, a, just a, a chance that it was the Lord was enough. And I love that. But we see that Jesus' presence brings opportunity. Jesus says, can I come? And Jesus says, come. Jesus' presence is what gave Peter the courage to do the impossible. Peter saw Jesus, and listen to this. He was immediately dissatisfied with being in the boat, and he wanted to be with Jesus. Now think about this. He was the only one that asked. He was the only one that said this. He was the only one that said, just that volunteered. That The thought came to him that if I'm in the boat and the storms are happening and we might sink and this is bad, he's the only one that thought, if Jesus isn't in the boat, I don't want to be in the boat either. I want to be with Jesus. Not everyone sees the opportunities, right? Have you ever been around some, someone that in the midst of just horrible circumstance, it's like they're seeing things different than everybody else? There's usually that one person in the crowd, that one person in your life, that one person in your family that when all hell breaks loose, they've got some silver lining that they see. And it's like, how did you see that in the midst of all this pain and all this suffering? But somehow Peter had the sight to see in the middle of these, these horrible circumstances, it would be better to be in the water with Jesus than in the safety of the boat. So in the middle of the storm, he wanted to go deeper into the storm if it meant being with Jesus. Man, that's a huge thing to take away for our lives. That God, if I'm in the storm, if it means going deeper into the storm, if that, if it means that's, if that means I'm going to get closer to you, then that's where I want to be. Maybe it wasn't even that, J that Peter was being heroic. Maybe he was just trying to get to the one that could save him. Maybe his faith was in Jesus more than it was in the boat. How many of you are just a little afraid of deep water? You've been out on a boat before. I, I know what times I've gotten out in the ocean and I love to swim and you jump in the water and, and maybe you got a mask and you look down and, and you're in deeper water than you've ever been in and you can't even see the bottom. It's a pretty eerie feeling, right? And it just feels safer when you get back in the boat. Well, Peter wanted to be with Jesus so much that being with him seemed safer than being in the boat. His faith was in the one and only way, the only one that could save. And so he had the faith and the courage to walk on the water and go towards Jesus. This was significant because Peter was a fisherman. If all these guys were afraid of the waves and the storm, it must have been really serious, right? But his view of Jesus was bigger than the storm, and we've all got to get there. We got to see that Jesus' presence brings opportunities and it doesn't matter how bad things are in our life or what is going on. We've got to get close to Jesus. We can't be content with where we are at right now. We've got to have this desire to change, to move to the next level, to grow spiritually. We must love God so much that we want to step outside of our comfort zones to do whatever he is calling us to do. And at this moment, Jesus called Peter to come, come. Come on, let's go. Peter didn't wait for the right time. He didn't wait for the waves to calm down. He didn't wait for the right season in life. He didn't say, I'll serve him when. I know I've been guilty of that. How many of you? It's like, man, I'll, God, I'll serve you when things just calm down a little bit. God, I'll serve you and I'll do X, Y, and Z when, when the kids get 
in school. God, God, okay, now I'm going to serve you, God, when, when they get out of high school. God, okay, God, I'm going to serve you when I, I'm done paying off their college. Oh, God, okay, wait, wait, now I'm going to serve you but when I, when I just get in the right place in my retirement and, and I've got enough. Oh, God, wait, I'm going to serve you after I've just played golf for a couple years after I retired. Oh, God, uh, uh, and before you know it, your life is spent. Your life is over. And so if there's one thing that we get from Peter, it's that Jesus' presence is what brings you opportunity. And being with him outside of the boat is so much safer than being with him in the boat. The fourth thing we see from this story is that failure is inevitable. Failure is inevitable. It says, so Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. At this time, the, the other disciples in the boat are like, what? He? Him? He walked on water? No one could, could, could believe it. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. So look at this. He has this moment of extraordinary faith. And by the way, Peter is all of us. Haven't we all had this moment of extraordinary faith where we're like, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bust down the walls. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to follow you no matter where you lead me. Whatever it takes me, I'm going to go. And these moments where we're just so full of faith, we're moved by the moment, and then we're reminded of our frailty. I don't know about you, but I'm there almost weekly. It's like, oh, God, you've given me inspiration. You've given me, you know, uh, the motivation. And then, oh, my goodness, I remember how frail I am. I remember how weak I am. And so this is just a great example that we've all failed. We've all sunk. We all have too little faith. We all come to that moment where we desperately cry out, save me, Lord. And if you haven't come to that moment, I pray today is your day. I pray today is the day where you become so incredibly aware that you are not capable of navigating the storms and the waves and the troubles of this life that you cry out with everything that is in you, Lord, save me. Why? Because fear destroys your focus and you begin to sink. And so when it happens, and it will, because fear is inevitable, I just want to encourage you today to cry out, save me, Lord. Save me, Lord. Because failure is inevitable. The Bible says all have sinned, fallen short of God's glorious ideals. And so all of us need to come to this point where we cry out to him to save us because we can't do this on our own. The fifth thing that we see in this story is that when we fail, we gotta fail towards Jesus. We gotta fail towards Jesus. Don't fail and go back to the boat. Fail and lean into him. Fail and cry out to him. Fail and reach out to him. So what does the verse say? It says, Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. And that's how it happens. When you call on the name of the Lord Jesus, he immediately grabs you. He saves you. He said, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? Now, how many of you are just a little uh, kind of put off by that? And, and you're like, well, Jesus, why didn't you just um, uh, praise him for the effort? <laughs> Jesus, why didn't you give him his participation trophy? He took a few steps on the water before he started singing. God, Jesus, why didn't you at least say, man, good job. Thank good. Man, you tried so hard. I'm so proud of you. Isn't that what we say to our kids? It's like, oh man, I'm just glad you tried. I, I love watching you play. I love watching you do it. You know, you just lost 15 to one, but hey, hey, great game. I'm so proud of you. See, that's the, that's the culture and the, the attitude that we live with. But Jesus did the exact opposite. He's like, what in the world are you doing? You have so little faith, right? Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back in the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped him and said, you really are the son of God, they exclaimed. 
So think about this. Peter fails. Jesus rebukes him. And then what happens? The other guys all exclaim, you really are the son of God. What picture does that give us? That even you, in all your failures, in all your weakness, in all of your lack, when you fail towards Jesus, when you step out on the water and step towards Jesus no matter where he is, and when people even see you fail, if you're next to Jesus, guess who they see? They see Jesus. The disciples didn't get back, you know, the, Peter and Jesus didn't get in the boat and all the disciples were like, ooh, did you see what Jesus said to Peter? No, they looked and said, he really is the son of God. He really is the son of God. He really is full of that much grace. He really is full of that much compassion. He really is full of power. The disciples knew Peter. And I bet they were surprised that he walked on water because he was a knucklehead just like you and me. But when he failed, they didn't see his failure. They just saw how good Jesus is. And that's what happens when you fail towards Jesus. When you fail and keep pressing into him, when you fail, but keep him first in your life. Listen, church, challenge should be normal in our life. When God looks in your life and says, why do you have so little faith? Come on, come on, strengthen yourself in the Lord. That should be normal. That should be welcomed. That should be invited. Jesus didn't congratulate Peter for taking a couple steps in the water. He challenged him that there is more. And so I just want to encourage you today. If you've stepped out, maybe you've tried ministry. Maybe you've tried serving. Maybe you've tried telling your neighbor about Jesus. Maybe you've tried doing some of these things that you know you're supposed to be doing in the Christian life. And you feel like you, you fell straight on your face. It didn't go well. The words didn't come out right. You didn't make a difference. You don't think anybody sees you or listens to you or thinks that you're doing anything that matters, fail towards Jesus and keep stepping towards him and keep doing it and keep speaking up and keep doing what God has called you to do because when you fail towards Jesus, people aren't gonna see you and all your failures. They're gonna see him. Fail towards Jesus, church. Get comfortable with failure. It's only in that failure that you see the possibilities. It's only when you fail that you get to hear Jesus say, why? Why'd you doubt me? There's more. There's more where that came from. Those few steps that you took on the water, there's more. And so I just wanna encourage you today, if you feel like you're in obscurity, if you feel like the waves are beating you up, Jesus has showed up in your life today. I want to encourage you to look to him and hear what he has to say. He might be saying, hey, you need to get this right in your life. You got this sin. I need to get that out. Hey, you, you've got this mixed up priorities in your life. We need to get that adjusted and get God right back in the, in the first place. God might be looking at your life and saying, hey, Keep your eyes on me. All this stuff going on in the world and all these arguments and divisions, hey, none of it's gonna matter. When you stand before me and, you, and we look face to face and you get to answer for what you did with Jesus. So where are you at today? Where are you at? Is fear destroying your focus? Do you need to recapture that prayer life that maybe you've lost? Maybe you've experienced Jesus' presence today and it's bringing an opportunity. Maybe God's calling you to get out of the boat and walk towards him. 
And you might say, well, Joe, my, my life is pretty safe right now. I've got everything I ever wanted. I got the job, I got the cars, I got the house, I got the life, I got the friends. From the outside, life is pretty good. But Jesus is saying there's more. And you might fail. Why? Because failure is inevitable. You might step out of the water towards Jesus and give this whole Jesus life a shot. And you might start to sink. But when you fail towards Jesus, people are going to see that you put your faith in him. And even though you might not get it right all the time, and even though, you know, it might not all come out right. When you put your faith in Christ, others are going to put their faith in Christ. Some of you needed that encouragement today because you really feel deep down like you're not making a difference, like you've got nothing to offer, like you, because you're not like so-and-so that you can't really make a, a difference for the kingdom of God. But that's a lie. And so fail towards Jesus. Bow your heads and close your eyes today. If you're here today and you say, Joe, I need to, I need to put Jesus in the first place in my life. I need to make him my Lord. I need to make him my Savior. Maybe you've been running from God and you've, been, you've known about him, but you've never really made him your Lord. Maybe you've known the stories, but he's never taken that, that first place in your life where he's everything, where you surrender your life to him and say, God, I wanna do life your way, not my way. And so if today's your moment, and it's time to surrender your life to Christ. I wanna give you a chance to do that. And so if that's you and you say, Joe, I wanna give my life to Jesus today. With all the heads bowed and eyes closed here in this room, if that's you, just raise your hand and say, Joe, that's me. I wanna follow Jesus. I wanna give my life to Christ. Anybody? And with an upraised hand, you're just saying, Jesus, that's me. That's me, I wanna follow you. If you're online watching with us today, right in your living room or in your car, or wherever you're at, you can raise your hand. Why? Because it's not about what I see, it's what, about, about God seeing you in your heart and seeing that you're reaching out to him and saying, God, I need you, amen. If you're reaching out for salvation today from a loving God who sees you, who wants to save you, I just encourage you to pray a prayer just like this. And let's all, let's all repeat this after me this morning. Let's say, Jesus, I give you my life. I believe that you died for me and you rose again. I confess I'm a sinner and I need you. I ask for forgiveness. I want to live my life for you. Help me to follow you the rest of the days of my life. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that when you pray a prayer like that, you're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Amen. Let's give those that gave their lives to Christ today a hand. Amen. Hey, man, I'm going to say another quick prayer, but hey, if you are following Jesus and he sent you into some rough waters and, and, and you just need to fail forward today, as I pray this closing prayer before Ted comes and gives some announcements, if that's you, as I pray this prayer, just raise your hand and say, God, that's me. Here I am. God, we want to fail forward towards you. So much of the time we find ourselves in circumstances that make us lose our focus, that make us take our eyes off of you. And sometimes we don't even notice that it's you when you show up on the scene to help us. And so God, help us to step into your presence. Help us to pursue that prayer life with diligence. God, help us to put ourselves in a position where we can experience your saving grace. God, we wanna step out of the boat. We wanna step into what you have for us. Help us to do that with all the confidence that we can muster. And we know that when we fail, and we will, that you're gonna reach out, you're gonna save us, and you're gonna put our feet back on dry ground. Thank you, Jesus, for your amazing power in our life. We commit ourselves to you fresh and anew. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us online at Mosaic Church. We hope today's message was life-changing and useful. 
For more info, visit mosaiccincinnati.com.